I'd like to welcome my special guest and the first for me to do this with audio and visual is a chat in conversation with Carrie Reichard. Uh, welcome, it's so lovely to meet you. And you, lovely to meet you too. Thank you. So I've been, I've been fascinated by your work and I've been having a look through your website. Would you describe yourself as an artist, a craft? craftivist a mosaic artist or a mixture of all of them put together I really don't like labels I try I mean I hate the whole idea of labels and I also think that I've always evolved as an artist I think you probably would have said that a lot of work I did was craftivism but I would never say that that's what I do now um, it's very hard to define what craftivism is, but I don't consider what I do now in the public artwork to be a form of activism. It just isn't. It's a paid job. Um, I just think I've always had an ethos of wanting to make work that is, you know, it, my all the community public artwork I've ever done has always come from a position for 25 years of trying to work with local communities and make them have as much of a voice as possible in that work. I mean, way back when I started in the late 90s and I was just doing mosaics, we would always used to um, work with groups and try and get them to come up with their ideas and try to reflect that and try and get them to be making it and to be involved as much as in the process as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because I recognised quite early on that art was a form of therapy for me it definitely got me over some terrible uh, you know mental health issues and so I saw it so such a benefit to myself that I thought that when I went to teach art and when I did community art I was really like you know I couldn't wait to show other people because I knew what it, it had done and how it helped me yeah so that was my ethos and my position behind my work but over the years I've done it for 25 years and and you all know as an artist we kind of change we grow mm -hmm. we do different things I went from being a fine art, uh, someone who did fine art sculpture to someone that did mosaics that kind of went into craftivism. And then, but I spent eight years restudying ceramics and right. so it's just evolved all the time. Yeah, I, I can understand that completely because I, I came at it from the other way around. I, I started doing a, a fine art A-level and then studied uh, applied arts at university and began making these welded structures and covering them with uh, woven willow because I was just fascinated with textures that I could create for sculptures. So I was coming from it from a very craft angle, but then over the years, my practice has evolved as well and started to use digital technology and other types of weaving and really pushing the boundaries. And then now I'm working almost predominantly in bronze, uh, making pieces for landscapes. So it's, I think- you're... I started in bronze, at least Polly, oh, really? <laughs> doing bronze casting. And you know, what I think is funny is the definitions of art, because we've been doing this long enough to know that it changes. Mm -hmm. I don't know, how old you are but I'm 54 and when I went to university you did printing painting or sculpture they were defined principles and you weren't even allowed to cross over right. you could you know we weren't allowed to you know you had to decide which one you were going into and that's where you were this yeah. whole idea of craft I mean I didn't even know applied arts existed at that time and now you have all these craft ones or you have all these multidisciplinarian ones yeah. and so I find it interesting how the definitions have changed the kind of way that we we talk about art and craft has changed and i'm long enough to know when when craft was a dirty word it was something my mother did yeah. you know and that's become so <laughs> in vogue craftivism helped to kind of give it a bit of an edge you know that whole idea yeah. but all that do it yourself and and you can trace that back really to the to the early 2000s can't you where craft suddenly became there's a section mm. in the bookshop on craft or the guardian suddenly has a craft heading you know that was yeah. didn't exist you know 20 years ago yeah i think um well i'm uh, 45 now and when i was studying my art a level uh, i knew i wanted to do sculpture and the tutor said you know took me to one side and he says there's definitely a, a sculptor in the making in you but he said I'm worried that if you go the fine art route they're going to knock the love of making out of you because you're going to have to choose a very strict discipline and his advice to me at that time was why not do the applied arts you get to 
uh, just um, immerse yourself in all of these different practices, all of these tools and materials and just really experiment. And he said, I think that's going to feed that experimental side of you more. And he was spot on. He was so right. And, um, you know, a few years later, we was exhibiting side by side. And I always, you know, thank him for that advice that he gave I me. Think cause... Applied art came in after. Don't think it existed 10 years before that. When yeah. I was in it, I really think you had a choice of graphic design or fine art. And I didn't even apply to do fine art. I was trying to be a filmmaker. Oh. I'd, I'd gone to uh, Sheffield to, to apply for fine art filmmaking and took a film that they found so appalling that they said that if they had, if they could, <laughs> they would have erased it then and there. And they were shocked I'd made it because they considered it so misogynistic. And so I went to Leeds as a second interview, second choice. And I got there with this same film. And when I got to the interview, they said, no, our filmmaking course disbanded two years ago. And I was like, well, what do you do? And they said, we do printing, painting and sculpture. And I thought, well, I'm not going to get in now because I've come with a film. So I said, well, give me a hammer and a chisel and I'll do sculpture then, won't I? And the guy who was interviewing me, Mick Sean, gave me a place because he thought I'd be like a, just as a troublemaker, just gave, gave me this place. So I ended up doing a degree in sculpture when I'd never even, I'd done an art foundation but I wasn't ever going to go down the fine art path. I was going to go down the filmmaking path. And yeah. before that, I was into theatre design and set design. But I think I had I was sexually assaulted going her, going home. Oh just dear! Before I went to my art foundation, and I think that really changed the the way that my whole path went because I found myself doing art therapy to without really knowing it. Yeah. And so oh, you know, all of the way I've gone has just been happy little accidents where I yeah. think the main thing is that art or craft or making things is is the thing that I need mentally just to keep myself together and normal and straight yeah oh I'm very sorry to hear that but um I'm it's interesting how you can feed even the negative experience into your artwork and what it can well, that's been my whole experience itself. My whole experience has been dealing with mental uh, trauma and, and mental health has been through my ability to create, yeah. which is why I'm very passionate about it. And it's why I really can see the positivity, especially something like mosaic, which is meditative. Mm. That's where craft comes in. Yeah. That's where you get into the zone, isn't it? Or the flow, yeah. or you, you know, you're engaged in something where you're creating, but you're also like, it's like the greatest meditation. Yes, I can, I can completely understand that. I was watching one of your YouTube videos, watching you sort of cutting with the little, um, with the biters and trimming all the tiles and then fitting them in into the pattern. And it's, I can see a lot of similarities when I'm weaving, you know, that you just get into that zone, you've got your materials, you've got your music in the background and you're just so focused and you can lose yourself completely for hours. Well, this is uh, what they say about the flow, isn't it? With craft, yeah. that you can endlessly lose yourself in a meditative world, but you're always getting slightly better. Yeah. It's just kind of doing it over and over again. And I know that my mother was to knitting what I am to mosaics. My mother learned to knit when she was four in under the in the tube during the war. When she right. was four and she learned how to do it on four needles knitting socks for soldiers. Gosh. I died, my mum died literally knitting. You know, my mum <sighs> knitted all the time. There was a time when four days a week she was going around all the shops in London teaching all the new people how to knit. And so she was obsessed with knitting. But I've realised that that's what calmed her down. She learned yeah. from a very young age to knit. And, and I think she was always upset that neither me or my sister wanted to knit. We hated it. But you could see how that had influenced me because obviously yeah. I think I was probably hyperactive. I think I'm probably on the spectrum. I'm probably all these, um, we now have labels for everything. Mm -hmm. But I think she knew instinctively to give me one of those coloring in books. Do you remember them? Atari books where you had to color in like, basically they were just patterns and you spent all day long coloring them in, yeah. which is what I did. And now it's so funny because now it's the thing in the supermarket, isn't it? To go pick yeah. up your coloring books and lose yeah. yourself in, in colour. It is. And I suppose you can look at the way that you sort of the colouring by numbers and things from your childhood and that the way that you're setting out these huge maps for some of your mosaics that you've got this huge map that you've designed and then it's finding all the right pieces and the colours and the textures or the different patterns that you're getting from some of the ceramic and how that's going to fit into that map. 
in a similar way to how I'm looking at a particular shape and how I can move the, the knots or the weaving over that surface and incorporate the different textures in that way. Yeah, I think we're both quite interested in similar things. I think we're interested in the processes and what that tells us and drawing from history, but kind of giving it a modern twist. And, you know, I, I've, I've, I kind of describe myself as a ceramic collage artist in a way, because when I was back at college, I always felt like I couldn't draw, or I couldn't paint. I never felt like I was an artist. I was not one of those people that went around going, oh, I'm an artist. I felt incredibly insecure about that. And so I always used to do collages or I would always, I always made art by other means, whether yeah. it was through photography or collage. And I think what's happened is I've been doing it for so long that I've just become very skilled because like I said, I spent eight years at college doing ceramics or I spent a long time learning to mosaic. And so now I can incorporate all those skills together. Mm. So really I'm printing on tiles and then using those tiles more as a collage than a mosaic because yeah. I just love the fact that it gives me so many layers of meaning. And I love the fact that you can subvert mosaic. I've always loved subverting things. I've always liked the idea of taking things that are quintessentially British or quintessentially female or domestic and mm. putting a little spin on it because it's so easy to do, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I can um, I can understand that as well. You know, I one of my... Um, one of my hobbies, um, aside from gardening, is ancestry. And you know, I'm always researching my ancestors and fascinated by what they did. And with working class ancestors, it's sometimes very hard to find information out about oh, them. Because it's, I, I know that through my own kind of research, how hard it is. Mm. And particularly it's, the women as well, about. isn't it? Well, if they're not written in the local papers, they don't seem to exist. Because when I was doing <laughs> yeah. suffragette, when I was doing the suffragette piece for Liverpool, I had a book that named all the known suffragettes of Merseyside, but it clearly stated these were a middle class or above because mm. they would be the only people who'd get mentioned in the papers. Yes. So all that history just is is disappeared. Yeah, and I think. Um... You know, I've, I've been looking at what you're um, creating for, for Boston and I'm just at the beginning of my creative journey for the town of Boston. But it's sort of to delve into a place, to its stories, to its culture, to, you know, this rich tapestry of, of a town and find which bits are going to influence. Because I just love the way how you've got all those layers on your mosaics from the, the pictures and the quotes and the different places and pulling out all these different threads. And I'm, I'm really excited to see your uh, Boston boy when it's finished. Yeah, so um, am I. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's always amazing because doing three dimensional is very different to two dimensional. It's mm -hmm. a lot more hard work, but the payoff, should be good but it'll be fascinating for me to see because I've been working on this for so long and I've been so absorbed in Boston and and like a detective really yeah. joining Facebook groups and trying to unearth <laughs> interesting things and I suppose for me it's like trying to find little stories that in a sense tell a bigger story yes and so like I, I joined um, a Facebook group which is Fishers and Clark for people who'd worked at Fisher's Clark, who then became Norton Print. But they're a company that went for 200 years. And so it was really interesting. What, by going into those Facebooks, I, I got photos and imagery that were quite incredible. One of them showed all the people who died from that in the First World War. And it's quite interesting to, to see the involvement of it. And then they had um, they had pictures of like Miss Norton, you know, like the beauty pageant, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, which is so dated. But at the same time, they were producing stickers have pigs on it that say male chauvinist pig <laughs> i kind of i think it's really important for us you know how we were as society because we're so changing so quickly and, yeah. and the eradicating thing and this kind of whole idea of i don't know being annoyed about things or not people not having um the ability to hold other people's opinions and things or to understand things in more of context mm. so for me it was just like drawing all these little stories that would helpfully show how unique Boston is. But well, I can, I can, um, I can understand that too. I think with uh, my Pilgrim Woman project, it's now in its fourth year, and that's gone from so many different elements, from doing my initial research 
to traveling over the Atlantic to try and get that sense of separation that the separatists might have feel uh, to sort of going into the Harvard archives and going to Provincetown and then coming back and creating this series of um, Pilgrim Women sculptures. And the third one in the series is one for Boston. And there's a story that I really want to unpick a little bit more about the women and families that were arrested uh, and put in the jail. But the more I research, then there's other little things that sort of take you off on another tangent, isn't they? And uh, then you discover another story and you're like, you just see where these things are going to lead you. And I think that's one of the things that's quite exciting about Boston is like because of your piece and the fact that the three boys have all been made by women. And I, and I mean, I'm fascinated. I mean, one of the things I always do is focus a lot on women. We're often sold a, fit, a history that's not true. You know, we have to understand that women were women, women who did all the land and the war and all of those mm -hmm. things. So I always try to bring out those stories that I think are missing. You yeah, know, unless you go into a museum and you see, but even there, they it's always concentrated on men, isn't it? Let's face it. It is. It. Yeah. Those, yeah, and I and I think um, our role as female artists today is, you know, you're you're looking at the body of work that you're leaving behind, and you know, and you know, what what does that say about you as an artist, and what people are going to think when they're looking back on on what you've done, and I think if we can, for a small part of our career, unpick those sort of stories of women and showcase different elements of, of history, then, you know, it's a good feeling to feel like you've done something, no matter how small, you know, to just showcase uh, women's stories throughout history. And so it's, it's just um, a great position to be in as a female artist, isn't it, to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been really, I've been really focusing a lot on female art since 20, uh, 17 or 18, you know, between we celebrated women over 30 getting the vote, because that's the kind of thing, isn't it? Everyone celebrates the 100 years of women getting the vote. But actually, that was just rich women or women over 30 who were getting the vote and working class men who got the vote. Yes. You don't celebrate the fact that working class men got the vote in that year. Mm. But that's again all the kind of working class story that's just never told, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, I've tried really to focus a lot on, and also because I did this in a pandemic. Yes. <laughs> a lot of it was done. I was thinking the key workers. Yeah. But not the key workers of today, but the shop workers of 200 years ago. They would have lived through a different mm -hmm. pandemic. But all of those people that we've seen so much in the last year, how much we're reliant on the people who take our rubbish away or the people, yeah. you know, work in our hospitals, work in our schools, all of those people. So in a way it kind of validated what I was doing even more because I was trying to get some things that were modern from like following the Boston standard and following those little stories like in Boston I think it was the Miss UK who was a nurse who came back and one of the first people to volunteer back at Boston Hospital mm -hmm. but just those kind of modern day stories and then also trying to get ones from years ago like these people who'd won MBEs or there's I can't remember her second name but a Sarah woman who literally set up the Royal society of nursing and things that they she should have a whole statue to herself in boston yeah because if you look at one person but what i do is more i think of it it's like it's a little thing that you can go and look at and there's enough information that if that interests you you can google this person or you can look this person yeah. up or it will lead you there's so many points of reference that yeah. you can then go and explore yeah, I think I can understand that. So it's not just about one thing. It's sort of entryway is to lots of different items. And I suppose when when we as artists are given commissions, particularly for a, a very specific place, a, a landscape, you know, what's your what's your starting point? What's what is it that you go to first to get the ball rolling? Well, for Boston, I, I kind of I'd done some research to get the job, if you see what I mean, and to apply for it. And then I didn't do any. And then because of the lockdown, I had this great time where I could really uh, look at it quite intently. And I found a really good book. Is it Big 
It's the one that's it's one about the small town or big city. There's this very oh, yes. I've just little, started reading that. <laughs> oh, I thought that was great. I just thought that was fabulous because it was like little pointers, little interest. It wasn't bogged down. I could read that in three days and go, okay, I've got an understanding because I had, I think. What I always say about myself is I know nothing. I do not know geography. I do not know history. Every time I research a place, I have to kind of go through this tedious idea of trying to remember which king and what the Protestants were doing or the Catholics. I just don't retain this knowledge. Yeah. You know, I'm not academic. So I come with a real blank mind and go, right, okay, what's interesting? And I read that book and I and I've and I thought, right, okay, it's all about. And then I actually what I did was I looked up and I saw the coat of arms. Mm -hmm. And Boston's original coat of arms from about the 15th century is those two, um, it's two mermaids. And the women are supposed to represent Anne of Berlin and some other Duchess Mary. They're Mary and Anne. That's who they would think to have been uh, representative of. But their 15th century coat of arm was two mermaids with the Latin by land and by sea on it. It changed. I can't remember what it changed to, but it changed in about the 17th or 18th century. It's still two mermaids. Mm -hmm. But when I thought about that, it really made me think, yeah, Boston is by land and by sea because it's the agricultural epicenter. And you think about how they were at the forefront of seeds and manufacturing and canning and also by sea because of all the idea of the port. It was one of the biggest ports, you know, pre-Victorian or, mm. you know, now it has all of this um, seafood. And so it seemed that nothing much had changed. And that was a really good starting point, especially as they yeah. were boys. So I decided to make one boy by land with the mermaids on it. And one is uh, by sea and one is by land. And they... It's not total, but there's much more about sea things on one of them. And the land one's going to have an awful lot about, you know, the land army and the women and um, a lot about because I was really fascinated all by that idea about the Borstal boys that had been brought and came and built all the, you know, had done all the dredging and, and changed the land there and things. Mm -hmm. And so I've made them to be distinct two things, one to celebrate by land and one by sea so yeah. that was kind of the starting point of trying to work out what the idea would be and then after that I went to the archive not the yeah the archive at the civil hall and went for all of their stuff but then I kind of got stuck because we were in a lockdown and I couldn't go anywhere so that's when I started to read the books and go into all these Facebook memories Boston memories yeah. groups yeah they're I such a great resource aren't they I think um uh, quite often for me, it, I, I start with a book um, and trips to archives and then Facebook groups. And I, I'm talking to a Facebook group tonight called Lippy Women of Doncaster. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I've been amazed by it. It was, you know, this isn't something that, you know, this is something I learned through this job, really, because in the past I've always done things through archives and through local papers and mm. we, the libraries are shut everything's shut so necessity is the mother of all inventions so but it turned out to be really amazing because what I've tried to do is I've captured a lot of this via social media so I haven't just lifted a photo I've lifted the Facebook and their comments that run down it so it's like a snapshot so yeah. it'll be a story but then they'll be talking about it so and I've tried to capture a lot of it via the kind of how it would be seen on a computer and yeah. so it's seen the really old and like these got like adverts from the 18th century that advertise. Um, I got this from the archive. It was an advert that advertised toy, toy sale clearance. And I thought that's so funny because you don't think that people in the 17th century would be going to toy no. sale. No, you know, <laughs> that thing that unites us. It's that kind of here you are, here's a flyer saying you can buy toys cheap. Yeah. So I like things like that because they're like, they're, they're, that shows us how we're the same, same, but different. We're still going to try and buy cheap toys down the market. Yeah. And so I like the idea of having this very old posters and the graphics from that and can, having it side by side with some kind of Facebook snap or a advert that's quite modern. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose as well, what you're getting from that is, is that language and the way that pe um, people would talk, you know, both in newspaper articles, but in today on Facebook, how they speak, how they type things out, you know, they type as if, as if they were writing, don't they? I've got loads of emojis and things like that. <laughs> I like all that kind of mixture, you know, 
Yeah. And I wanted to make it kind of a snapshot of where we are now, but it also to be timeless. So yeah. when you look at it, a lot of it's all dated 2020 because I was tracking everything. I was tracking the Boston standard, Boston memories, and I think one other thing I was for the whole year, I'd been tracking it to see what the news stories were and to get little things because what I was very conscious of is that while I'm showing all the history, I wanted it to have something that was very people who live there now. I wanted, you know, I don't want to yeah. make it just all old English and show mm. how white it was or how this was, you know, even though I tried to tell all the stories of like the Irish immigrants that came and used to work the land and I found pictures that showed that in the 12th century Foley's which was a famous factory was getting peasants in China to pluck their feathers and send them back to us Gosh. and so there's these small things that you you know it's one little picture that you'd have to really look intently mm -hmm. to find but it's that kind of idea of showing the past and the future and try and make it as inclusive as possible yeah yeah I, I can understand that um part of my project going forward is to do uh, community weaving sessions and try and capture those voices uh, whilst they're weaving away and I think that going back to our very the very start of our conversation that way of being so engrossed in an activity and then the conversation just flows and precisely that's what I was going to say because you'll know that the same as me that if you get a group of people together you know and if there's if they were supposed to talk to each other they wouldn't but when you're <laughs> head down and when you're busy doing something you naturally start because we know that by women who used to all get together and make a quilt together it's kind of like a social interaction that's good for us and yeah. that had been the hope I was supposed to go to Boston and run mosaic classes and have an empty shop unit but it just all disappeared in Covid so this was the best mm. that I could do you know yeah. I had to try and try and make it inclusive without actually even being in Boston. It's quite a tall order, but yeah. You know. <laughs> um, but that had been my, my, I know that that would have been the best thing. It would have got them to actually physically mosaic lots of yeah. it themselves, which hasn't happened, but we have had them make fish and things. And so we've tried to uh, include local people in the making of it as much as we could. Yeah. So um, looking at uh, the future, when are we um, when are we going to see the Boston boys uh, in uh, situ? Do we have oh, any dates? To give a date, no, not on a date that I'm allowed to give um, because of COVID. Because you know, there's so many things that could stop this from happening. Mm -hmm. I believe it's going to be the beginning of July that okay. it officially opens. Yeah, around that date. So it. If that happens, it'll be perfect because it's June the 21st is when supposedly we get our freedom. Yeah. So it would be really nice if that happens. And, you know, I'd be, um, I just can't wait for it to actually to see what people's response is to it. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's a little later in the year. I'm working towards a November unveiling. So it'll be the end of November to coincide with Thanksgiving and the Illuminate Festival that happens across the Pilgrim Roots district. So fingers crossed that we don't have any more um, national lockdowns and we both get to get our artwork out there for the public to see. I, I, I'm quite excited for it because I think Boston's going to have really like with your work with the other boys that the other other artists are doing they've got other big projects i think you know it's going to hopefully make a difference it will yeah. make it a destination that people want to go to for its cultural for it to, to, to see the arts and things that's what i hope definitely yeah and i think for the the residents and the people that we've engaged it sort of helps them to leave their own legacy that they've left their mark on something in the town that they live in so hopefully that will give them that sense of achievement and proud pride in their town so um, before we finish off, if um, people are watching or, or listening to this, is there a, a website uh, that, that people can go and view your work? Yeah, you can go to my work, my website, which is, which is www.carryreichard.com, which is about R-E-I-C-H-A-R-D-T. It's not easy spelling, but I also have a By Boston By Land Facebook I kind of use but yeah if you look me up you'll find stuff yeah well I'd, I'd recommend that they do there's so much on there you know I had a, I had a really good delve through your website watching your little videos and interviews and looking at some of the artwork that you've done <laughs>
Oh, well, I'm glad you found it interesting. <laughs> it is very much so. So I just want to thank you again uh, for, for being my guest for my first In Conversation With. Um, it's been a delight to chat with you, Carrie, and um, hopefully we get to meet in person at some point in Let's the future in Boston. So. <laughs> yeah, and I look forward to seeing your Boston pilgrim woman. I think she'll go very nicely with the boys. I think so. Well, take care of yourself and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll get to see you soon. Bye. Bye. Spirit of Mayflower is part of a series celebrating my Spirit of Mayflower project. You can get involved in lots of ways. You can take a look at some of the movies and pictures I took on my journey by heading to the Rachel Carter Sculpture Facebook page. You can also head to my website at www.rachelcarter.co.uk and there you'll be able to view some of the sculptures I make, treat yourself to a limited edition Pilgrim Woman sculpture or take a look at some of the online tutorials. We're riding on the tide With a cargo full of hopes and dreams And a hundred souls inside We're crossing the great ocean we're riding on the tide with a cargo full